Yosemite is Yosemite. It's a crucible of American climbing, big wall climbing especially. I actually remember walking along the base in uh, the fall of 1963 and being completely mystified. Uh, I'd never been anywhere near an escarpment of that size or that, you know, perfection really. I think when I started personally, it was, it was the idea of doing everything. Of course you're going to do El Capitan. Defining, relentless, I mean, it's just, it's an amazing rock. There's, there's nothing like it on earth. Really in your face the whole time. Just the freedom that you feel being up there is undescribable. I mean, it comes back to what type of person you are, if you're gonna take the easy way out, let let your partner down. And in life, I didn't really want to be that type of person. Sometimes the fear helps you. Sometimes you want to suppress it. Sometimes it's there for a reason. You know, you're, you're afraid because you can get hurt or die. I don't know, there was just this natural draw for me, like that slab is the thing that is gonna be the most in my face that I could ever dream up. And so, <laughs> I don't know how to describe it, I just, I had to do it. I haven't ever had something in my life that was, I, I felt that strongly about that I had to succeed like I did on Wings of Steel. It's not an appealing route, it's not a classic route. It's, it's not an aesthetically pleasing route. It's not the kind of thing that people are used to doing on El Cap. And so about the only appeal to Wings of Steel is just that it's really hard. We then found ourselves with two major things confronting us. One was a climb that was harder than we imagined the climb was going to be. And then trying to figure out how we even work with the climbing community to be even able to get the climb done. And so now we're fighting a war on two different fronts. And so that helped ramp up the entire experience to be one that just became epic. Wings of Steel is one of the more notorious routes on El Capitan. I think largely because it's a route that so few people really know about. And it's always those things with mystery that no one can really pin down. And since no one had repeated it, it was really up to the first ascensionists and everyone's interpretation around the first ascensionists. And you add in the fact that there was kind of this outsider factor, how these people weren't part of the inside crew in Yosemite. And I think that just expanded everyone's ideas about what might have happened and what could have been the style. I started climbing very early 1983 and this was after Wings of Steel had been put up and so I was hearing about it kind of afterwards there was still talk of it that's how uh, in the thoughts and minds of the people in that community it was and um, being a beginning climber I had no concept of what hardest routes on El Cap or any big wall were at the time but um, there's definitely this news that these guys had been on a wall longer than anyone else previously had and because no one else had been on the route they assumed that there were tactics being done that nobody else was doing and 
tactics that probably were offensive to other climbers. But again, no one knew whether what tactics they were using per se because no one got on the route until Ammon did. I can't really state this much more strongly. The lack of honest and forthright disclosure about their preparations, their methods, and their execution on this climb is, is what has gotten Jensen and Smith in trouble. Obviously, there was a tremendously violent reaction to these guys coming into the valley and establishing this route on that very unusual formation on El Cap. It wasn't just an El Cap route. It was a route that was largely comprised of a line on the King Slab, which was, uh, is a very unique formation. It's uh, a very steep, almost featureless, smooth slab, and the rest of El Cap really doesn't share that kind of uh, terrain. Now what I think uh, Jensen and Smith were trying to avoid, because they kept meticulous records uh, when, when they wrote their book, if they're to be believed, and that's a very big question, they kept meticulous records on the number of bolts that they placed, rivets, CMAX, all that stuff. Um, they realized, I think very early on, that if they disclosed every time there was a percussive force used on a placement to do their route, uh, that they were immediately going to receive round condemnation. I mean, we never thought the route was a great route or an aesthetically appealing route or anything like that. So, you know, if people critique the route, we sit around thinking, yeah, a lot of what they're saying is true. Uh, but when they start saying we lied or we did this epic botch job or we were incompetent and then we lied, you know, that, that really galled us and it galled us for decades. The way those guys did this route and the controversy that surrounded it, I think, kept people from being interested in climbing it. Uh, it we just never would have imagined it would have mattered to people this much. I, I really can't say that I have any respect for them. I don't have a good thing to say about them. It is a phenomenon to me to have been here only 40 years or so now and think about how many thousands of years that rock has been standing, you know, that rock face. And, you know, there's always uh, folklore, what do you call it, mythology or whatever about the native stories of the Tutankhamun, you know, how the people looked at this rock, a sacred rock, if you want to say it, um, phenomena of nature, a beautiful thing to look at. And then next thing you know, you got guys thinking about climbing up there. What has this rock represented for any of us? And then when we talk about controversy, egos, bolt cutting, uh, you know, free climbing, all this uh, being played out on the, the stage of El Capitan is so interesting. You know, it, it's very interesting. For one thing, why would anybody, why, why would we really do it? And what are we getting out of it? I've climbed El Capitan 70 plus times. It was, you know, by far kind of the thing that defined the whole trajectory of my life. And to this day, I still spend, you know, a lot of time involved with the story, with the routes and with the people around it. It's hard to climb El Cap, even by the easiest route. It's no small deal. You know, even now, even with all the gear being what it is, even with all the information that's around there, uh, the failure rate on El Cap is still quite high. I think when I started personally, it was, it was the idea of doing everything, all the forms from bouldering to one pitch routes to multi pitch routes and building yourself up to, of course, you're going to do El Capitan. You know, that's just the direction you would go. And you never know how far you would get. You never know when you might do that. But yet at 17, there was uh, Warner, Braun, Dale Bard, and John Back and myself doing the nose together. And it, it was interesting because we were free climbing almost everything on it at that time. So there is that lure, there's that um, some kind of commitment you've made within yourself to climb it, you know. And, and then once you get the rhythm of it, that's why I think it's interesting with Amon. Once you get the rhythm of this and you, you know the, um, the protocol, you might call it, you know the system of big wall climbing, it becomes such a great place to be 
because it, in essence it brings you back to the basics of life and, and, and really feeling alive and living by these skills that you need to, to figure out each pitch, by the amount of gear that you bring, by just being out there on, the, on that rock face. You know, I've been doing it a long time and I just feel at home up on the wall. I know exactly what to do. Everything is in its proper place. Everything, the structure that I get from it is, uh, you know, awarding. And uh, it just, everything seems at place while I'm up on the big wall. Well, when I first uh showed up in the valley to go climbing. I just wanted to go do some free climbs, you know, Cookie Cliff, little stuff here and there. I had no intention of doing any El Cap routes or any aid climbing whatsoever. But it's always, it's, you know, you drive right by it every time you're going down the canyon um, through the valley, it's there. It's a big giant piece of rock, big stone they call it, right? There's no avoiding it. Well, you're not really a Yosemite climber until you've climbed El Capitan. You know, I've been climbing for, uh, what is it, 48 years now. And, of course, I've known thousands of climbers. And it's always been my opinion, and it, that opinion grew in its confirmation, that people who are, are flat out unafraid at when, when they start to climb, when they begin climbing as a, as a art or whatever, those people that aren't afraid are actually very dangerous and often get killed. Um, the fear is an appropriate appreciation of the situation. Yeah, fear is definitely a big part of the, the big wall equation. Uh, if it wasn't for fear, I probably wouldn't go up there. So I feel very in control up on the wall, even when sometimes I feel like I'm not in control because I'm run out on scary hooks or whatever. Um, I kind of this uh, have this visualization of the anchor and everything's nice and as long as I know how it how it's all put together it's like a puzzle piece and in my mind that fits then it just feels right up there um, even when I, I am on scary pitches and I think that I might fall uh, it just it's Something about it makes it all kind of click together. Climbing for me has always been this like personally introspective, uh, I don't know how to describe it, it's, it's an attempt to confront myself internally. I think most people live their lives making a lot of decisions based upon what they're afraid of and what they're trying to avoid. And for me, climbing has always been a very intentional attempt to beat that back and not let it win. I know that climbing this wall, I was going to be, you know, a different person by the end of it. And it was going to add attributes to myself and better qualities. And I was going to learn a lot up there. And it mostly about, you know, when stuff gets hard, you push through it. I think that in order to understand why we chose the route that we did up Wings of Steel, you have to talk about the reason why we were climbing at all. At that point in time, I was just leaving my teens, heading into my 20s, and I was at a point in time in which I think that although I didn't understand it explicitly, that intuitively somewhere within me I was trying to figure out who I was. Did I have what it takes to, to be a man? Who was I going to become? Was I able to take control of my own destiny? The thing that inspired me about Wings of Steel is because of the history and that nobody had done it. I kept looking at the topo going, well, it looks like a bolt ladder. How come nobody's done this? How come nobody's done it in half a day? Everybody talks so much smack on this route. You know, if it's so easy, how come it hasn't seen a second? So that pretty much was the key motivational thing that made me want to go check it out and see what Wings of Still is all about. Just got down from the bottom of, for the day and it's fucking horrendous up there. 
I was gripped out of my mind and I wasn't even the one climbing. <laughs> Ammon took a couple whippers, but he survived. What can I say? Been hooking. Been hooking. Certainly someone has to do a second ascent of the thing. Ammon's the man, he can do a second ascent of anything. I mean, regardless of the difficulty, if anyone can do it, he can. Ammon and I were talking about, I had the urge to get on some big walls and it was my last semester of my bachelor's and a little stressed, so nice to go relieve the stress climbing big walls. And we thought about some ideas and we tossed it around and Ammon really wanted to climb Wings of Steel. I had to get to the bottom of it. I wanted to figure out what the route's all about. You know, because it looks totally different on the topo than what you're actually climbing. Yeah. Here we are on the second pitch of Wings of Steel. Kate lounging. It's been a beautiful day. Came down that crazy slab. Lots of hooking. Our flotilla down there. There's where we gotta go. I see one bolt and then lots of hooking. Lots of slab. Their whole story is really out there of how the community, uh, com you know, treated them for what they were doing. You know, here these guys show up and they think they're gonna do something pretty rad, which they did. Um, so it, it's pretty awesome that they're they're resilient enough to kind of put it put it past them and be like, all right, well we got treated like shit, but that's kind of the way the world is. It really is. It's kind of sad to say that, but. I can look back and say, well, okay, we had horrendous weather situations that took away days. We had water running down the rock that delayed us for days and days worth of climbing. And uh, we chose not to climb on Sabbath days for religious reasons. And so that all adds up, but it's still 39 days, really. And so when Ammon was on the climb, I think it took him, if I'm right, 13 days in total to complete the second ascent. And that to me was one of the most significant things that came out of, out of the second ascent that I think has helped really put my mind at rest that yes, this climb was what I thought it was. I think Ammon's ascent was uh, really sort of impeccable. Uh, they just went up and they did everything they could to, to climb it. And obviously it was a very difficult, very strange and unique route. 125 hook moves. Um, when maybe some of our hardest routes have maybe 15 or 20. I mean, hard aid climbing is about your head more than anything else. You know, the techniques and the equipment, those are all necessary conditions, but you've got to be really good at that stuff. But if you don't have the head for it, then it really doesn't matter how technically skilled you are. I think one of the hardest things about being involved in the second ascent was blowing Ammon and having to deal with him taking these pretty big whippers and whether or not they were big or small, but there was quite a few of them throughout the climb. I mean, on every pitch you could expect a hook to blow off and the first couple of falls he took you know I braced myself but after a while it starts to kind of wear and tear on you a little bit. Yeah yeah here we are on pitch two under lovely canopy. Kate's trying to fly it back into reality. having some uh, mental 
some issues up here like always it's it's hard she's been watching me whip left and right and she's not psyched she doesn't want to see me whipping anymore nope. what's up babe do you are are we gonna bail what are you thinking right now I'm thinking You're kind of over it that my mental game's not where it should be and for up here you need your mental game to be dead on so that's kind of what I'm thinking right now as much as I want it to be there it's not I'm not a big fan of watching Ammon take big weapons I'm not hurting myself though so you know I'm pretty good at what I'm doing. You're just, it just mentally frazzles you, huh? Yeah. Your nerves have had its last, it, like, you're done as far as nerves go. Yeah. That's what I feel like. I really don't, I, you know, it's kind of a disappointment if I go down. Yeah. Well, kind we of have your partner down in that regards, which completely sucks. You got that on your shoulders. You know, if anything, I just want to see Ammon do this. He's been wanting to forever. I thought I could help him out by being supportive, but unfortunately, my mental game's not there, and I wish it was. Well, things change, and it's not done yet. We'll we'll see what happens. Yeah. We'll you know, we will see what happens. I wouldn't have wanted anybody else up there, but her. You know, at that time, um, she helped me keep it together at times when I thought I was going to lose it, and then, you know, vice versa. During that breakdown, I kind of wanted to take the easy way out. And thankfully, Am and we uh, spent actually probably about a whole day talking back and forth about it, whether we go down. And I knew if I went down, I'm gonna let you know, let him down on something he wants to do. And so after a while, he convinced me, you know, spend the night up here. Let's just take it easy today. See how you feel in the morning. And so we did that and thankfully I was like, all right, I can do this. Nine of the days were on the slab, pretty much a pitch a day. Um, it was pretty much unlike any other route I've ever climbed. There's, it's pretty unique. And because it was so different, I kind of had a harder time wrapping my brain around it. I was born in a little town in uh, Provo, Utah, in a little house, and my dad delivered me. No midwife, uh, just my mom and my dad. And I came out backwards, breech backwards, with my butt sticking out first. And uh, yeah, the first thing I did was took a big dump, <laughs> pooped all over my dad. and. Uh, yeah, that was kind of funny, and then he said that I pulled me out further, and I had the umbilical cord wrapped around my neck. Uh, and my face was purple, and I didn't have any oxygen, and he had to untwist this umbilical, umbilical cord around my neck. It was probably clove hitched, I don't know. Um, yeah, so since day one, uh, epic, but I survived. I'm kind of a fighter, a survivor. We grew up in St. George, Utah, and tons of rock around, a lot of sandstone, 
right in our backyard. Ammon was always the one getting out there on the rock, taunting me up, come on, get up here, <laughs> you know? So we'd just go up, you know? We didn't know about ropes, you know, until, you know, the, the mid 90s. We were just in our street shoes, whatever it took, but we knew we couldn't fall. I started rock climbing uh, in the early 90s and I was introduced to ropes, uh, different climbing techniques about around that time. I've always ran through the hills while I was growing up and scrambling on stuff and um, I just loved the mountains and the hills. He climbed everything in that town, everything, including the uh, reflector tower up on the Black Hills. You know, it was his regular, you know, ascent. He'd go up there at night, go up to the reflector tower and walk across it. You know, it was about 18 inches across, lay on there. My dad took us camping a lot and I was involved in the, in the Boy Scouts. Um, so sort of hiking and rappelling and uh, just being in tune with nature was uh, a, a good part of my childhood and upbringing. We used to see these climbers up there on the wall in Zion and be like, man, how do they do that? <laughs> you know, just blown away. We didn't know about ropes for years to come, but we did like, you know, the climbing was always ingrained in us, you know, still is. And my older brother is one of my best friends, Gabe. He still uh, climbs with me. First time I climbed El Cap was with Ammon. It took several tries to make it up. We had different storms and we kept going back. We were tenacious. We were in hammocks in the 90s, which is unheard of. Those things were from the 70s. <laughs> but we finally did make it up. Uh, the South Seas was our first climb that we actually topped out together. And Ammon led most of the pitches. He's a hard charger, man. I can't say anything more about it. He just charges it. He gets up there. He takes it, you know. He makes it look easy. And I remember walking into this, uh, this gear shop and seeing this poster of uh, Dan Osmond and Jay Smith on the side of some Alaskan big wall. Uh, and I just couldn't, I couldn't peel my eyes away from this poster. I just kept staring at it and I was just awestruck. Um, I couldn't believe people are actually living on the wall like that. Uh, and that was kind of my first huge impression of, of big walls and I just had to get into it. And I started asking friends around and, uh, you know, how do I get into this big wall stuff? And everyone's like, oh, that's, you know, you need thousands of dollars, you need a portal edge and thousands of dollars worth of gear and rope. And, um, you know, I just, at that point, I couldn't wait. I wasn't rich. I couldn't buy all this gear. So I just went to Yosemite and and found a partner and started figuring it out. And I did the NA wall solo, spent nine days up there. I remember several pitches where I'd run out of gear and have to lower myself down and back clean all this gear because I just didn't have enough gear. And uh, I didn't have a portal edge. I borrowed a hammock and a hammer. I didn't even have a hammer bought a couple of pitons and went for it. Yar, the El Cap Pirate. People have kind of been calling me the El Cap Pirate for years because I couldn't afford gear and I'd go try to booty whatever gear people would leave behind up on El Cap. I'd hear about it. Oh yeah, there's some, I left a cam up there and I'd go do the route just to get the booty and they started calling me the El Cap Pirate. I think Ammon is just a real adventurer. He just always wants to charge hard, and the rest of us, you know, love to get that in little bits and pieces in controlled environments, and as we get older, it fades away, and he just has it in his blood where he just, you know, wants it every day, every week, 
and, uh, and he gets it. You know, more than a climber and a jumper and all that, I just love adventure. I love going out and doing something that I have no idea how it's going to end up. That's what it's all about. Why did the climbing community have so much problem with their ascent, with their attempt, uh, their beginning, the route, and then after? The real gist of the question is, why couldn't they just go up there and do the climb? Why, why did it become almost like a world event for, in climbing that they went up there, put this route up, and it was so roundly rejected? Reading Richard's book, Wings of Steel, uh, he makes it sound like there was just a lot of competition for that thing and that people were just going to get on it. And if, if he, having spotted the route and having fallen in love with the idea of doing a route there, uh, if he didn't act quickly, that somebody else was going to grab this. I wasn't going to do it. I really don't think anyone else had much of an interest. The big question with Jensen and Smith centered on how well prepared they were. They really didn't spend any time in the valley climbing anything. They, they uh, spent all their time practicing their skills and learning in isolation um, down in the Riverside Quarry, fell in love with that place. And uh, I've gone to the trouble of finding their guidebook and going back and looking at it uh, to find out, okay, here's these routes you guys said you did to prepare yourselves to get up on this climb. How much microflake hooking is there in your area? How much copper heading is there in your area? After the chopping had occurred, um, and uh, this whole thing was turning into a great big harangue, the Park Service, uh, the rescue site folks, uh, had to call a meeting. And they pulled Jensen and Smith in, and they started asking them really pointed questions. Like, look, guys, you know, do you have any wall experience? As, as you should to perform properly. It's a resource that has to be rep respected. It isn't really a play playground up there. And that level of respect is the issue uh, with these guys and how they were treated. There was a significant aspect of intimidation that we felt. We really weren't secure or didn't feel secure for our, um, our own safety. And um, at times during the um, near when the climb was chopped down, it, 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 was, it was scary. You know, we were wondering, are we going to turn a corner somewhere and run into climbers that are going to physically make it basically end our climb for us? The whole reason there's insiders and outsiders is that climbing has this very strong ethic and this very strong idea about what's right and wrong, and it's not objective. It's completely subjective, and so it's defined and then maintained by someone and, and those people are the insiders and they they're not doing it arbitrarily they're doing it based on the history and, and where they think things should go but the second you are outside of that um, they really respond to that for good and for bad. It was difficult for outside climbers especially climbers from other states and stuff to uh, you know come here and climb and Get, they had to earn their respect maybe more so than some of the locals. There is this kind of ownership thing, which is weird because it's a national park. Nobody owns it. We all own it. And uh, at first, everyone kind of tiptoes. You know, I tiptoed. I wanted to make sure that what I was doing was very much in the spirit of the people I looked up to, the, the legends who climbed these routes first in the 60s and 70s. And so at first, I approached it from that perspective, which a lot of people do. And then the more I climbed there, the more I felt like I was now a guardian of whatever that ethic is. And I think that's what happens. A lot of people who put in their time, who feel like they really are following in the good style of the first people to climb there, then become kind of the unofficial police force. And what that sets up is kind of a insider outsider mentality one of the reasons i've never embraced surfing yet i'm sure i'll find a place but this territorial 
bit I hear about most surf places is that if you're not in with that group, you don't surf these waves. Um, I have, uh, I'm a very non-confrontational person, um, so I would avoid that. So if I had caught that anywhere in climbing, at any climbing area, I would never go there again. It's just nobody has the right to say it's their climbing area. I think it's fairly common to be treat if you're an outsider to be treated with a little disrespect not generally to the extent that they received it and I think a lot of that has to do with um, how they came to Yosemite and what they did aside from the actual route um, they didn't kind of like meet and greet the locals they didn't try to become part of the local scene and I think that was a big mistake on their part they, they need to meet the people who are there, living there, doing the similar routes that they want to do and, and at least get somewhat of a little bit of an approval from at least a few people. That really is it. It's a respect issue. Uh, and when you're looking into the mindset of the people that chose to chop the route at the time, that was it. It's like, who are these guys? You know, they're coming in here. They don't seem to know what the hell they're doing. And uh, they seem to be, you know, drilling their way up this climb. We had the thought, which proved to be naive, that if we kept a low profile, we were friendly to people, we didn't cause trouble, we kept our heads down, that in the end that we wouldn't receive any undue amount of um, pushback from anybody. Well, of course, that proved to not be the case. We'd go to, you know, the Yosemite Village store and we'd just be trying to, you know, buy a carton of milk or something. And, you know, we'd have a dozen climbers gather around us, back us up against, you know, the, the cold area and just basically scream and yell at us until finally some checker would call security to flush them out of there. I mean, we'd be just walking across, you know, an area like this and be recognized and have climbers just surround us, you know, 10, 12 climbers just surround us. and threatened to beat us down and uh, talk about how we'd be walking through the forest and uh, you know there'd just be the sounds of bones snapping and then they'd ship us out of here in a box and they were talking about blowing my car up and it really got pretty crazy uh, and so you know when finally they cut our first two pitches down you know we realized these guys were really serious and had to be contended with this wasn't something that we were going to be allowed to just do. The pushback that we had escalated into physical threats against us. Um, eventually the sabotage of our gear, basically what you'd have to call criminal acts. And we were intimidated, scared enough that we, we weren't sure that our physical safety was, um, was in any way assured for us to even continue the climb. And I think a huge preponderance of climbers would agree that no one had a right to uh, tear the route out uh, shit on their ropes, or um, in the case of another party that was climbing above uh, the Wings of Steel party, um, to throw um, shit on them from above. Incredibly, I had a um, paper sack of human feces exploded just feet above me. Uh, the community response to chopping their route at the time, uh, and I, I can't say it's a community response, three guys made a decision that uh, these guys were disrespecting tradition so much that they had to be stopped. It could be boiled down to a question of whether you own the rock or not, yes, which I guess a bunch of Camp 4 regulars and, and a couple SAR members thought they did. But it was also more turf, question of turf or control of the sport. You don't treat anybody like that. Those guys were disrespected. Who shits on somebody else's ropes? You know, who, who does that? You know, these, these guys are out there trying to have fun. Bottom line, climbing is about fun. These guys were given no leeway at all. And I understand, you know, that they were new and they were out of, the, you know, they were into a new territory. They were like, you know, newbies showing up on the North Shore, North Shore going out there surfing, you know, and, and they were taunted and they were harassed. I don't think it's fair at all. You know, these guys, uh, it happens in life, you know. What are you going to do? Yeah, I don't think uh, Richard and Mark 
deserved what they, what, you know, how the locals treated them. Nobody is, you know, even if they did a bolt ladder all the way to the top of El Cap, nobody's deserves that treatment. So it's really interesting that the controversy comes into it, competitiveness comes into it, ego comes into it. And again, these are all the things that, as human beings, that we're challenged with. And, and so when we say selfish, that may be true, because it... But this is why maybe a film like this can be a good thing, because what we're really trying to look at is what have we learned? How has it helped our development as human beings? How has it given us some kind of idea? When we got on the climb, it proved to be more difficult than we thought. We thought this climb is gonna be really hard, it's gonna push us. And it was harder than we realized it was going to be. And that was before all of the pressures came to bear upon us from other climbers that thought that it wasn't a good thing that we were there at all. And so the combination of what we were going through to make it up the rock itself, with all the pressure that we were coming under, proved to create the most difficult situation I've faced in my life. It was incredibly hard. And the harder it got, the more I realized I must finish this climb. And so with Wings of Steel, I think that I intuitively had a notion that if I failed in this climb, that it just meant that when things got really hard, I didn't get the job done. And I had a notion that that couldn't happen, that somehow, some way, I had to finish the thing off. You're two days into this, three days into this, and you're just getting really tired of it. And so, I mean, I, I, I take my hat off to Ammon to just, you know, endure, because that's what a lot of it is. It's just, you're paying the price all the way up that slab. Here we are on the third pitch of Wings of Steel. It's a gorgeous day, a little cloud cover. Kate, how are you feeling today? Feeling better. Yeah? Yeah, I woke up this morning, we decided to uh, push it up a pitch yesterday, get our ledge up higher, um, and I feel a lot better this morning, not as uh, mentally, I feel a little more mentally in check now. So nice, yeah, yeah, you seemed a little fragile yesterday. It happens when you're on a route like this, huh? Yeah, it does. As the climb was happening, and especially after it was over, I've looked back and tried to think, did I do anything that helped bring this on to myself? And looking back, I feel like the answer to that is no. Um, we did everything we could to keep our head down, to be non-confrontational, and that's pretty much my personality in general anyway. Richard is more of an upfront person but we weren't getting up front with anybody in this climb. We were just trying to keep to ourselves. People want to hear stories about climbs being pulled off in bold and daring ways and done well. That's what lasts. That's what gets respected. Uh, Jensen and Smith wanted to be respected just for simply having survived their climb. And there was a lot of talk at the time. Uh, when they got shoved off over into the aquarium, finally storms came in and they were in a pretty bad way up there. And there was a lot of talk at the time, you know, if the car comes out to rescue these guys, we're not going to do it. We're going we're gonna to let them, let them meet their end up there. And that's pretty harsh. I feel like the four of us, we have something, it's a, that route in general, there's something about it, you know, and we all four of us know what it's like up there. And a lot of people have, have shared their point of view on the on the route but I think it comes down to the four of us know what that route's about. When Ammon and Kate decided to go and repeat the route uh, to me it was a great personal relief because I wasn't going to have to go monkey around wasting climbing time that I didn't have just to debunk these guys and their climb. When they announced that they were going to head up on this thing I thought good for you guys. This really, this is going to give me what I, what I need as a historian, which is an accurate accounting of how you did what you did, and this should be interesting. Ammon was obviously a completely unbiased person, you know, credibility to beat all. Um, one of the fastest climbers of all time has done the hardest routes on El Cap. So, I mean, you know, he's got the background and the credibility to do a second ascent and then report on what he found there, and everyone, including us, would know that you know, what he reported was credible and accurate.
problem with wings of steel is you're going to fall a lot and you're going to fall down a slab. And so you're on an 80 degree angle slab, which means, it, and it's glacier polished, so you're going to fall at almost the speed of falling through space, but you're against the wall the whole way. And so you're falling at this very high rate of speed, and you're going to fall a long way. You know, 50 to 60 foot falls on wings of steel are, are you know, to be expected. And you know, watching him, he's so smooth from hook move to hook move, and sometimes he doesn't even look like he's breathing. And if he takes that deep breath, that hook's going to pop right off the rock. On pitch three, Hammond's about 30 feet to the anchor. Yeah, basically he's just knocking some little pieces of flakes of rock. I don't know if you can see that on me as he's climbing through this section. It's been a beautiful day. Um, a light cloud cover all day long with slight sprinkles. So we've been pretty cool on this slab. It'd be nice if the rest of the week was like this. Oh wow, we just missed a massive fall on Middle Cathedral. Massive rock fall. Man. Yar, baby. Yar. How is it? It's doing good, how are you? Excellent. You did that fabulously. Thank you. Instead of how many falls he took, it was the how many falls potentially could have. You know, I had to figure new things out and had to compromise and um, so it was, it was frustrating in that way, but you're on the slab and it seems like you can almost free climb it, but you can't quite. And so you're just hooking on these incredibly small edges and just kind of laughing about them going that'll never that'll never hold but somehow they do and somehow you you continue going upward on an average on wings of steel i probably took six or seven falls a day and they were always cheese graters it was always sliding down the slab and i had to actually get used to turning my body and and slide different ways because I'm not you know muscle memory when I fall like I'm usually in the air so it was uh, different it was a sliding down the slab I mean I don't know how Ammon can take these falls and then just keep charging because especially with the climbing when you take a huge fall it's really hard to psych yourself back up. I think Ammon does have a whole different relationship to fear than the rest of us because even people like Royal Robbins, Jim Bridwell, I remember going to their slideshows and they'd say, oh, I took four falls my entire climbing career. And climbing with Ammon, I feel like four falls is the average on one climb. And that's not to say that he's less skilled. It means he's just pushing harder. Uh, I forget which route, but he took a whipper and they called search and rescue and he said he had like some stuff oozing out of his head. Well, I was photographing Adam McNeely. He was climbing on a climb called Surgeon General. Third solo ascent of Surgeon General. I took this nasty fall. I banged my head really good, cracked my helmet. Tom saw me through his telescope. Tom, and that's where he fell from, all the way down to where his belay is. I heard this scream. He was hanging from the end of the rope, sort of upside down, motionless, with his arms strung out, and I just did I couldn't believe it. Pulled my helmet off. It was kind of some white, pussy, oozy-looking stuff. I shook it off, you know, sat on that ledge for about 30 minutes. A helicopter ended up coming and trying to rescue me. And of course I was having none of it, mate. Do you need help? It's all good if I fail, I can live with that. But if I fail, I'm gonna get myself out of the mess. You do not need help, and you want us to go away, correct? I'm like, all right, they're down there watching me. I think I'm just gonna have to get back up there and start climbing, and then maybe they'll go away, and sure enough. Good practice, it was 
very good practice. We're all gonna die one of these days. You know, it's a matter of time. You definitely rub elbows with death a little bit and uh, that's part of what makes it exciting and makes you want to survive all that much more. We climbed a, a new route, Jose Memorial Variation, our buddies, Jose Pereira and uh, Joe Crow, Jose Crow, died in the same year and he wanted to put up a memorial for them. My nephew Austin, Ammon's son, and I, the three of us went up there and we did different variations near the Zodiac, you know, some Eric Cole routes over there and Zodiac, you know, all pieced it together and we called it the Jose Memorial. It's uh, not an independent line, really, you know, I mean, all the way up, it's just piecing it together, but we wanted to pay homage to our buddies, man. You know, I want to cry, <laughs> miss those guys. <laughs> I can't, I can barely talk about that, man, you know, both Jose's were great. I'll never forget the time, the last times I saw him. You never think that it's going to be the last time and sometimes climbing's dangerous. I worry about Ammon once in a while. <laughs> when I'm afraid or if something has gone horribly wrong, I'm at my best. I shine when when I need to. Here we are on the top of the fourth pitch of Wings of Steel. A little bit of hooking down there to get to the blade. Uh, Seems to be the usual. Yeah, the usual hooking, hooking, hooking. The problem with the hooks on Wings of Steel is that, you know, what most people think of with a hook is you've got something about the size and shape of my finger here and you're on something maybe the size of my finger and people tend to think of that as pretty hard hooking but wings of steel you're climbing on stuff that the little flakes of rock are maybe as big as a nickel glued to the wall and so the edge is like maybe a sixteenth of an inch wide and so the hook that you're on is i mean i can't even demonstrate it with my finger it's it's a tiny little strap of metal i mean they're rated to like two hundred pounds and so what happens is when you put this little teeny chisel point on this little nickel sized edge and you start putting your body weight on it, well, what happens is this little chisel point starts actually biting down into the rock. And so as you're moving your weight onto this hook, it's, it's creaking and chipping and it's actually like trying to shear that little flake off the rock. And as you put all your weight onto this thing, it develops tremendous tension in this little strap of metal and so if it does succeed in shearing that flake of rock off, then what's going to happen is that, that tension in the metal gets suddenly released and the hook goes ping! And it makes this really loud, really audible ping sound as this metal just goes ping like that, just suddenly releases all this tension. And that sound alerts your belayer that you're now headed down at high velocity. So, you know, be ready to catch the fall and get launched up into the belay anchor. All of us who are climbing hard and base jumping, we just love that feeling it gives us. But pretty quickly after we get that first taste, we then really kind of ratchet back and try to make sure that we're being safe while doing it and, and maybe just hold back a little more. And he, just around life in general, says, no, I'm going full speed ahead. I just want more. Two, one, see ya. Ammon jumped off a tower and I was his base, you know, I was the guy at the bottom waiting for him to get us back to the hotel. We were doing a job in Pittsburgh at the time and uh, the guy was shattered. We got him back to the hotel and uh, the blood was coming out of him and it was steaming. <laughs> and he was telling us, don't call the paramedics. He's like, I'm fine. And I'm like, no, dude, you're, you are not fine. We have to get you to a hospital. He ended up spending three days in the hospital and he didn't want to even have us call. So yeah, he's a little bit crazy 
as far as, you know, I mean, he doesn't have a pain threshold. He'd just die first, I think. He would have bled to death if he hadn't got there, you know. Was, you know, when steam is coming out of a wound on your leg, you know, I mean, he, he had some pretty serious problems. He's healed up from that. That's his good leg now, by the way. <laughs> What's she eating? Mac and cheese. Wait, let me see the can. Cheesy burger macaroni. Mmm, Shepardi. Mmm. Always can count because they're a good source of protein. And then there's that doofy looking guy right there. Yeah, that's pretty doofy. That means you're going to pretty much taste the same shit time after time after time. But they're just different noodles. Yep. Different texture, same taste. Yummy. They're pretty smart, aren't they, for doing that? Mm -hmm. Like boxing the same thing? I don't know. All I know about is we got to get up this route. How did the last pitch go? We sent it. Pitch four. I tried to... I took... I started the uh, pitch a few nights ago before you had your meltdown. Mm -hmm. um, I took some whippers on some rusty heads. It was almost a joke because I knew I was going to whip. I went back up there today, uh, tried to beak through it, and the rock was a little crumbly, and I ended up putting one good head in and hooked past all the other bullshit. We, uh, if I make it relatively easy up to this next one. Yeah. We'll, we'll decide. But I may have you tag me a beer. Okay. So yeah, just put it in whatever's easiest. Whatever bag's the closest. Right. Right then. Right in. Cheers, mate. Cheers on. Cheers on. We're we'll like you chitting later. Ammon's second ascent to me is quite impressive. He led every pitch. At least when I did it, I would lead a pitch. When I hit the anchor, I was thinking, hey, I've got two days in which I don't have to do anything that's dangerous. So the thought that he came back day after day to do lead after lead, that's really impressive. I'd get to the end of one of my pitches and I'm drilling that, that last bolt, you know, the, the first anchor bolt. I get that bolt in, I clip into it, and it's like this huge weight off my shoulders. Like, you know, for the next two, three days, I'm golden, man. I can't get hurt or die at this point, you know? The main thing about climbing with Ammon is he's just really good, which is a good and a bad thing because it means you can kind of check out a little, which often means you want to just kind of you know, you get a little more afraid and let him do a little more of the work. Whereas if you're in a situation where you know you're the stronger climber, you know, you have to get through it. But you know, every climb with Ammon, he just charges so hard that it's hard not to be like, oh, I'm not feeling quite right. Sure, you can lead another pitch, which, uh, you know, isn't always the place you want to be. You want to pretend that you can charge just as hard as he can, but uh, that doesn't happen. Here we are on the sixth pitch, the top of the fifth belay. Uh, through this water streak here, every morning it it pretty much runs. They call it the faucet bivy. So uh, it runs to the two black streaks right there are the most prominent streaks. Uh, I tried to climb it last night, didn't get too far. 20 feet, 25 feet, um, ran into a drilled hook and broke the flake off of it um, and tried several other times, three different times and ended up partially dislocating my shoulder. Uh, put it back in and didn't know whether we were going to have to bail last night. Um, just kind of riding it out. It feels better. I bounce back fast, I'm strong. We'll see what happens. And they're different than just falling in the air and 
and getting caught by the rope. These are knock down, drag out, you know, gear going everywhere, sliding down the slab. Uh, I dislocated my shoulder at one point from just having my shoulder in the wrong, wrong spot at the wrong time. Uh, hurt like hell, we continued. <laughs> and I'm gonna be dead serious with you, you know, it's like Ammon's not gonna come down. He's gonna keep climbing. Unless he's unconscious, that'd be about the only <laughs> reason I'd call a rescue probably. I mean, if he broke a finger or an arm, he'd probably still keep climbing. That's who he is. Now we're gonna start pitch eight. Looks like on the topo, all of them, they look like bolt ladders, but you get up here and it's a rivet right off the belay, and then it's about 30 feet of hooking to the next rivet, it looks like. Um, yeah, but on the topo, it looks like a, a rivet ladder. Pretty funny. But that's uh, typical wings of steel, so there you have it. 8.30, or at the Overseer Roof, we're pretty excited. We are done officially with the Great Slab. It was a tough one getting up that slab. Took how many days? Four. Took about Eight seven. Days. Seven days, a whole week to get up that slab. So we have four pitches left. Basically going out of the roof and then traversing, last pitch is a traverse into the aquarium. We're psyched to do these next four pitches and get off of Wings of Steel and motor up to the top and be done with this adventure. It was a nervous time for me because even though I was confident that what the climbers would find up there would vindicate or at least validate the statements that we'd made about what the climbing was like, to have climbers there that have both done multiple, multiple El Cap routes and have been on some of the hardest stuff, probably the hardest stuff in El Capitan, I was concerned because if they come back with a report and they say, you know what, this climb is really just, you know, it's not good, it's just a, a bunch of nothing, then that's pretty much the gospel truth on that. Um, that's, you know, what could I ever have to say then uh, other than to just acknowledge, all right, well, I guess the climb was no good. So when you produce something that a critic, someone who's highly respected, comes in to evaluate, yeah, I would say that was nervous time. Well, we are off of Wings of Steel, officially on the Aquarian route. Uh, did good, last couple pitches went really well. Uh, the what was it? The twelfth pitch was rated A3 plus, and I felt it was more like A1 tricky. Uh, all the placements were good, so um, you know, with our modern technology, our modern gear and stuff, that might have made it easier. They did. They don't have some of the stuff we have today. It was a good, a good solid route. They did a really good job. It was hard, challenging. Um, what they reported was pretty much spot on and what people thought about the route is not at all what the route is. When we finished the climb, the reaction from the community, it seemed to me like everyone was pretty proud that we had done it. Um, and thankfully, you know, Am and I felt like it, we were kind of putting a little bit of an end to a story that kind of needed to be ended. At one point on the super topo, Pete Zabrock asked me the question, look, Steve, you're on these guys really hard. What do you want out of them? And my response was, well, for starters, I'd like an admission, an admission from Richard that he would do things differently knowing what he knows now. Pretty simple, pretty fundamental stuff. It's only been since Hammond's second ascent that it comes out, hey, we didn't lie. You know, we weren't lying up there. Everything that we said about what we did was what we did. And um, so that's the vindication, I think, that we were seeking all this time was, you know, just stop attacking us personally. 
you know, after talking to Mark and Rich and being up there with Ammon and hearing about the whole Wings of Seal saga, and I, I'm glad I went up there. Good job, Kate. Woo! Sucking the center wing of steel down. <laughs> I kind of doubt if Wings of Steel will ever see a third ascent, but it's actually starting to creep back in my mind. I might go do it in a, in a one day, who knows? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a climber. I'll always be a climber. Climbing's my community. And even though I've been, for a span of time, was ostracized in Yosemite Valley, um, I'm not ostracized as a climber, especially not now. And the climbing community is a part of me and I'll always be a part of it. Well, I think Wings of Steel is probably the toughest thing. I mean, physically, mentally, emotionally. It hit all three of those. It's probably the toughest thing I've ever done in life. I'm too busy having fun and just doing my thing. You know, it's hard to stop being a kid sometimes. Whoa, dude, here he comes. The flying monkey. <laughs> The first rope climb he ever showed me, he climbed a telephone post in Huntington Beach with slings and a rope. And he protected himself, he climbed up the telephone post. <laughs> okay. What do I want people to get from this film? Inspiration, to go out and do whatever the hell they want to do and have fun as long as it puts a smile on their face. <laughs>